Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. So we are singing Alleluia today. We are celebrating Jesus rising from the dead. Jesus risen from the dead. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. An extraordinary day for humanity. A pivotal point for the history of mankind that death is overcome definitively from inside. We have a beachhead beyond death. Today there will be a special text. It's called a sequence uh, after the second reading before the Alleluia and is very rich in contemplation of the joy of the resurrection. And I invite you to pay special attention to it. It is good that we are here in the chapel of Mary Magdalene because she was the first witness to Jesus risen from the dead. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. O God, who on this day, through your only begotten Son, have conquered death and unlocked for us the path to eternity, grant, we pray, that we who keep the solemnity of the Lord's resurrection may, through the renewal brought by your Spirit, rise up in the light of life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter proceeded to speak and said, You know what has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. 
We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible, not to all the people, but to us. The witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commissioned us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Israel say, his mercy endures forever. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. The right hand of the Lord has struck with power. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. (coughs) This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord this has been done. It is wonderful in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. Brothers and sisters, if then you were raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, not of what is on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, your life, appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. The word of the Lord. Christians to the Paschal Victor, offer your shameful praises. O humble sheep redeemer, Christ who only is sinless, reconciled sinners to the Father. That then both have contended in that combat suspended, the Prince of Life who died reigns immortal. Speak, Mary, declaring what thou sawst with bearing, the tomb of Christ who is living. The glory of Jesus' resurrection, bright angels attending, the shroud and napkin resting. Yes, Christ, my hope is arisen to Galilee, he goes before you. Christ indeed from death is risen, our new life obtaining. Have mercy, Victor King, ever reigning. Hallelujah. 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 Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us then feast with joy in the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning, while it was still dark, and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we do not know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there, and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first. And he saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture, that he had to rise from the dead. The <clears throat> I will continue to read the following passage of the Gospel. Mary Magdalene stayed outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she bent over into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop holding on to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them, I'm going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and then reported what he had told her. The Gospel of the Lord. So today we are filled with joy, and it's not easy or wise to tell people directly, especially if they're very sad and beaten up, like they were after the crucifixion, it's not easy to tell them to rejoice. They cannot switch gears too easily. Just a small little human detail about the wedding we had here uh, two days ago. Uh, The day before the wedding, the groom's grandfather passed away. 
and I met the groom's parents here at the wedding and so it was the paternal grandfather so the dad was here for his son's wedding on the day after that his father had died it just helps us to enter into the complexity of the human heart in our different relationships and experiences that in the joy of the resurrection it's not an easy joy like getting an ice cream getting some superficial delight it's a whole process of entering into the joy of the resurrection entering into the victory of Christ and really uh, this example is not wayward because the eternal Word of God became flesh, became incarnate, and the law of the incarnation, the law of the incarnation, the principle by which that whole process is working for our salvation is through the humanity. God is working but through our humanity, through our humanity in the person of Jesus. It's our humanity, our shared humanity. And then he is very sensitive to this and follows that principle of gradual transition. Then we could start at a different point thinking and pondering on Resurrection Sunday on the day of Easter and we could think, okay, Easter didn't happen yet, it's going to happen soon, and I'm in charge of organizing it. So how would you organize Easter? How would you organize the greatest victory ever happening for humanity? What kind of preparation would you have? And let's think of, maybe I shouldn't bring up this example because you might get distracted, but don't get distracted in the concreteness of your particular situations, but just in the generality. Or maybe let's go to something less um, dramatic in your own countries to, let's say, at some point there's a new monarch in an oriental land. Can you imagine the preparations to install the new monarch, a new emperor, in an exotic land when all the people will celebrate this victory because they are all affected by a new monarch. And how this would be organized, how the feast would be celebrated, how everybody would be notified, how everybody would prepare their towns, there'd be symbols put up and pictures of the monarch and people would celebrate. And that's not how it happened on the resurrection. It's amazing because there were angels present also at the birth, but for the birth they gave a concert, singing in the heavens a large host of angels. But in the resurrection there are two angels and they seem to be very discreet like discreet assistance of a major CEO or important person and they're doing their duty very discreetly. They're delivering the message and there's no fanfare. There's no fanfare in the resurrection. It's really amazing. One of the things that I've pondered a lot that recent, maybe I don't know how long I started doing this, but for decades for sure, is pondering how difficult Easter Sunday was for the Apostles. Because they get the news in the morning that something is different. And the first news is brought to them by Mary Magdalene. Because she ran to the tomb while it was still dark and there's something wrong. The stone is removed. It shouldn't be. He should be dead. He should stay dead. And we should have a problem to open the stone in order to finally anoint his body for the final preparations for burial. But there's something wrong, the stone is removed. And then Mary Magdalene runs to Simon Peter and to John is understood here, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and says the stone is gone. There's something wrong. 
So from this moment of first inclination, and maybe some of the other disciples also are hearing this and they say, well, we'll let Peter and John go and solve the problem. We don't need to get our hands with, dirty with other problems. We've, ha- we've been through enough already. And in the process, the account of the gospel shows us that John believed. We won't go into that part right now, but it's, it's a process as well. It's a process of observation of how everything is in the tomb. And it's a process also of obedience because he's letting Peter in first. It's very interesting to follow this pattern in the New Testament. And, and he reaches belief. But we see that the apostles have the whole struggle all day. And that evening when Jesus appears to them in the upper room, uh, they have not believed. They're just beginning to believe. And even Thomas, who was not there, won't accept their word that he's risen, that they have seen him. So we're into a process of the greatest event of humanity happening, and it's trickling into the consciousness of very beaten down people. And if we think about humanity in general, we've got quite a bit beaten down. We think of all the human trafficking, all the wars, all the discrimination, all the injustice, often perpetrated by baptized people, maybe ordained people, people of Jesus' own mystical body. And we see so much damage, so much prejudice, so much hatred, so much suffering, so much grief, so much illness, so much division, so much tension. And bringing the news of the victory into that mentality, into that mindset, into that resignation, into that lethargy, into that deadness. Not just the deadness of the dead body, but the deadness of our whole get-up. You know, we have the experience in these hot climbs of tiredness, exhaustion, fatigue, especially if one has the nerve to go hiking across a desert in the summertime. And you learn from the Bedouins and others who are used to these regions that you don't do that in the daytime, but sometimes we do that foolish thing. And then in the afternoon, how hard it gets. And to raise up somebody who has been through that whole ordeal, and there's no persecution. There was even free will to do it. Imagine all the beating down of humanity. And to bring in the joy of the resurrection, we kind of don't want to believe it could be true. And that's one of the challenges of the resurrection, to be accepted. That we don't want to believe it could be true. We prefer, we believe bad news more readily. Why is bad news better consumed than good news? And the core of the good news is the resurrection together with the Incarnation. The Resurrection is its full blossoming, the total victory. But it's a victory that's in a seed form. It's absolute, it's complete, it's going to go forward, but it's in a seed form. It's hidden. You never see the tree in the seed. And in this seed form, humanity has its victory, but it's going to take a long time. And those hours on Easter Sunday are very painful because the disciples are pondering their infidelity, their poor choices, their wrong choices, their cowardice, their negations. And the women didn't have this problem because the women had already had gone through that purification and they had been faithful to Christ. They had received, in a way, a fullness of grace of acceptance, and they were with Christ all the way through Calvary. And in this sense, Mary Magdalene is the door opener for faith for humanity, and she receives the risen Christ. Then she calls up Peter and John And they're slow about believing. The disciples don't want to accept her message. It can't be true. She has to be out of her mind. 
And so we find ourselves today. You believe in the resurrection, most of you who are participating in this Mass, I'm sure. And you, you want to communicate it, but you realize that a world around us is not receptive. The message of the resurrection is still in seed form for all those who haven't seen the tree blossom. They haven't seen the tree grow. It's hidden in the seed and you have the seed. You have the joy. Mary Magdalene had that joy. The joy of knowing the risen Lord. And little by little, there's a lot, there are a lot of factors involved. One is grace. The grace to receive. There's also the humility. We have very clear evidence that, for example, Thomas was stubbornly resistant to belief. And he set up tests and trials that would have to be fulfilled for him to believe. Later he abandoned the trials, but Jesus insisted that he do them. Put your finger in my wounds. Put your hand into my side. Lord, help my unbelief. Mary Magdalene also was not automatic. She went through a process, maybe more quickly, but she went through a process. And a process of new relationship to Christ once she discovered that he was alive again. She had a lot to process still for her whole life afterwards, as we do, that the resurrection will really come home to us. That we will accept that faith, that we will say yes to that faith. Faith is a relationship. It's a gift of entrustment that God reveals himself as he is to us and we have to accept it. It's also really the structure of relationship between spouses, between parents and children, between friends, and really between all members of the human family. Our, we have to believe the other, believe their word, trust. Trust today is very injured, very damaged. Faith is very injured, very damaged. On the other hand, it becomes very easy to give faith foolishly to something that doesn't have substance. And the consequences are sad. So we are in a particular challenge today to receive the joy of the resurrection. And this should be our first petition to God. Help me to know you risen from the dead. Help me knowing you to experience you risen from the dead. To experience through faith. And then knowing you risen from the dead to have a growth in hope. So when I have been in patterns of discouragement and despair about many things, I have to put a big question mark over that attitude as correct. In fact, I might have to change it. I might not have to despair over a bereavement. I might be able to open a window of hope. And I need to open it for myself. And I need to open it for others. And a person building on that gift of faith and that disposition of hope can love, can sacrifice, can give, can give light, can give encouragement, can lift up the broken and the downtrodden. Let us ask today for the great gift of faith in the risen Lord, like Mary Magdalene had. And let us, like her, run to tell the others, but to run particularly through the transformation of our own lives. We slow down the delivery of the resurrection when it's not in us first. It's not just words. It's an experience. Let us ask for that grace. It's a gift. Faith is a gift. Hope is a gift. Love is a gift.
So we come before the Heavenly Father with all our prayers and petitions. We ask, first of all, for the grace of an encounter with the risen Lord in faith, hope, and charity. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask for the grace of being freed of the resistance that is in us, the lethargy and a kind of inherited sadness and negativity before the grace of God's victory in our lives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask for the grace of an openness of heart and an open eye for our brothers and sisters, for our neighbors, our friends, to tell the good news. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And now we pray for all the intentions each of you have in your hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we bring you these prayers through Christ our Lord. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice and your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Exultant with paschal gladness, O Lord, we offer the sacrifice by which your church is wondrously reborn and nourished through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right it is truly right and just our duty and our salvation at all times to acclaim you, O Lord. But on this day, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true Lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying, he has destroyed our death, and by rising, restored our life. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, 
these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church, be pleased to grant her peace to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Pierre Battista, our Patriarch, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you, for them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God living and true. Celebrating the most sacred day of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, and in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. And blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, which we make to you also for those to whom we have been pleased to give the new birth of water and the Holy Spirit, granting them forgiveness of all their sins. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands. And with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said a blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven, of Christ your Son, our Lord, we your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the Just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, to command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, 
in the sight of your divine majesty so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also your servants who have gone before us marked with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and form by divine teaching, we dare to say, Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we wait the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your Church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under our roof. But only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. The body of Christ give me safe for eternal life. Amen.
Jesus, thank you for bringing us the joy of the resurrection. Thank you for rising from the dead, for us and for our salvation. You did this for us. And we are slow sometimes to receive the good news. And it's not just a verbal good news about something far away. It's actual reality that's given to us through faith. The access to the resurrection is not through a mass media campaign. It's not through an announcement on major media. It's a grace that comes in the inside. It's prepared by speaking this faith. Faith comes through the ear, from a heart that believes. It grows in us like a mustard seed until it changes our whole mentality our affectivity, our understanding, our will. Jesus, help us to receive the grace of your resurrection, that it will be like leaven that raises the entire dough, that this good news will be like an electric jolt inside of a person that has been deeply damaged by a heart attack or a brain injury, and this electric jolt will bring back life. It's not just information, it's a new life that's born. A new life is born from one little cell. This gift of the initial faith that you give us, that you bring to us, and you help us to open our eyes to open our ears to hear, to receive the word like the seed that falls on good soil and that brings forth a great harvest, first of all inside ourselves, a great harvest of transformation and renewal, a harvest of kindness and goodness and compassion, a, har a harvest of new outlook about pain and suffering and illness and all the difficulties of life. Jesus, thank you for opening up this new realm of life for us through the resurrection. And Jesus, help us to open ourselves up for this, to become like sponges, to soak it up, to receive it and to pass it on. Lord, we rejoice in your victory. You did the incredible for us. Let us share in your joy. Let us enter into your joy. Let your joy enter into us, even slowly or quickly, but let it enter into us definitively. Jesus, we believe in you. Jesus, we hope in you. Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we adore you. Let us pray. Look upon your church, O God, with unfailing love and favor, so that renewed by the Paschal mysteries, she may come to the glory of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the Gospel of the Lord. There's another very beautiful key to enter into the resurrection. And it's the story of another woman. A young woman, and still really a young woman, who was told by the angel, and you will have a son, and he will sit on the throne of David his father, and he will reign forever. And imagine that woman having so many different experiences that cumulatively build throughout her life and she's pondering them in her heart and when Simeon says that a sword will pierce her own soul and when she has to run with the baby before Herod to Egypt and when he goes on his public life and spends 30 years as a carpenter when is he going to sit on the throne of David and then he goes in the public life and they reject him and the authorities crucify him. Such a horrendous death. And it's her son. And it was promised. Blessed is she who believed. What did the resurrection mean for Jesus' mother? And to contemplate Jesus risen through her eyes, through her sensitivity, through her love, she gave him his body. She educated him helped him to eat, to drink, to clean his mouth, to clean his hands, to meet people, to greet people. What must it have been like for her to contemplate her risen son? So that's when we are praying the mystery of the resurrection. It's really a powerful decade of the rosary, to be with Mary watching her son risen. Blessed is the fruit of your womb, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. And Kathleen has written up some very beautiful take it home, bring it home. You know, to switch from being on a Good Friday or at a funeral to a wedding is not easy. Like for this man who was here on Saturday having being with his father as he died, and then being with his son as he got married the next day. And there are some very practical little tips to be in a beautiful place, beautiful flowers. And Kathleen suggests there to dress white and to listen to some very powerful, good music. And she gives you some very concrete suggestions there of different pieces of music. Each one will have their own taste and their own preference. But the idea is to help us into the environment of celebration. And we don't have to do it violently. We can ease ourselves into it. Easy goes, little by little. And ease ourselves into a situation of celebration. And that's where we are at now in the glorious mysteries. Time of victory, of celebration. And let us get into that festive spirit of celebration of the mysteries. Thank you for joining us. And we're so happy that Johanna helped us also with extra violin music and with those beautiful hymns. Uh, God bless you.